a farming business on Liverpool Plains. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about um, what we do, our numbers, our management. Um, I'll probably have a bit of a whinge halfway through um, and I'd like to talk about the future. Um, that's our business. We've grown that since 1959. Um, we try to look after most of the things that have just been spoken about already today, especially the soil. Um, it's the number one. Um, but basically we're a producer and we produce. That's our job and we think we do it pretty well. Uh, we grow all sorts of crops. We grow some of that durum wheat that Barnaby was referring to this morning that sold for $578 a tonne this year. Um, that was a good thing to do this year, but we've got it wrong plenty of other times. That's the breakdown of our farming area, um, and I'll touch on that in the numbers. Uh, we do store a lot of grain, um, and we use that as a marketing advantage and also a management tool. Uh, we employ five full-time staff and lots of others at different times of the year, and we really en encourage um, community involvement from both ourselves and our staff. Our staff. Um, Australia, the lucky country. We've got unique scenery, unique animals. We've got great land area. We've got no people. Sometimes that's a problem. Uh, we've got a fragile climate and we've got food production on a grand scale. That's how I define the country, but a mate of mine in Scotland once des just des described Australia as a desert surrounded by a beach. And that's really probably sometimes closer to the mark. Um, we do produce a lot. Um, in this country, we've never had any food issues. Um, we export 60% of what we produce, and we've heard that number plenty of times today. But we've never been hungry in this country, and that probably doesn't do agriculture the best service, because most countries that have been hungry have a very different view on their agricultural community. Um, we all know the answer to this, but probably the significance of this is that we're no longer riding on the sheets back, but that means it's even more important that we sell the right story and a good story. Um, the themes of our business, we can touch on management, we can touch on measurement, we can touch on the pillars of our business. In our case, they're the crops we grow, that we call them the pillar crops, we try and work out which is the best one each year. Um, the external influences um, and the future. Uh, in relation to management, we spend a lot of time in our business, it's a family business. Most family farming businesses, and some of you may have seen me describe this before, business, family, not. Um, we spend a lot of time separating the two, like most other businesses do, um, and we've found that being a very effective system to help us run our business. Um, we have board meetings, we've, we've written a strategic plan. Do we always stick to it? Probably not, but at least we've had a go at writing it. Um, and we do look, spend a lot of time uh, training our staff and involving our staff in the decision-making process of our business. Uh, it's a family structure, it's a company, there's my brother and myself and our families. So it's only my brother and myself and our wives currently in the business. There's no children back there yet. Um, but back when we started up, we were going to do the traditional family business, split in half, go our own way. Um, and thankfully we didn't do that um, because it really didn't make any sense either way. Um, all that did was clarify goals. We set up the board st structure. We put an independent chairman in, um, and we've actually got three non-executive directors now, um, and my brother and myself. Uh, when we began, we met every two months, and we started on April Fool's Day 2005, so if something's going to fail, it's always a good day to start. Um, we, we've been through everything from debt restructure, dividend policies, commercial rents, our roles and responsibilities as family members, and also our staff training and job descriptions. Um, and we really tried to work hard on our key business relationships. And realistically, by separating these two, you actually start having decisions about the business, not just emotive decisions. Um, and board papers are distributed to, to all family members. Um, and if anything is in particular, uh, we'll, in, we'll invite family members along if it's something that's it's a big picture stuff. Like any major purchases, we have all of us there. Measurement. It's interesting you talk about measurement. I was listening to the radio this morning. The beauty about living in Spring Ridge, you get to leave home at 4.30 to get here by 9.30 in two plane trips. But on the radio this morning, one measurement I heard was that um, New York set a, a new record this year. And that, this is about measuring things. They went 11 days without a murder. Now, I thought it was significant. First of all, it was on the ABC radio in Australia. And secondly, the fact that they even measure that at all. The fact that they measure when they don't have murders, not so much when they do. Um, but you can measure whatever you want if you think hard enough about it. I'm going to talk about returns, our expenditure, our scale, um, our plant and equipment, or as I call it, the toys or the junk, um, land use, and basically if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. 
You've all seen these before. This is our benchmarking group. On the left-hand side, you have the good performers. On the right-hand side, you have know, the performers not going so well. Um, that, that particular year was a very good year. This is the five-year average, so the black dot is the average. So if you look on the far left, you've got farm 11. The black dot is its average return over five years, and the red is the variance for that farm in that period of time. Um, it's just really, it, we continually compare ourselves in our business and these other businesses to try and get better. Um, if you look at scale, on the left-hand axis, you've got return on assets managed. And when I say return on assets managed, it's all the land, all the toys, all the junk, everything stacked on one side, and that one, what you return after all costs and salaries on the other side. But if you look at that dot, big farms make good money, but small farms do as well if they do it really, really well in our area. Plant ratios, top 20% is on the left. If you spend less per hectare on machinery in our area, you'll make more money. It's as simple as that. Um, machinery people don't like it. Quite frankly, I wouldn't own a tractor at all if I didn't have to, but we'd still need them as a matter of doing business. Uh, land use, the red part of that graph is the cropping area. You can see that the top 20% are Liverpool Plains. You get a greater return from cropping than anything else. This, um, we've touched on a lot of this stuff already. That's um, their actual sales put together by a farmer on the Liverpool Plains who clearly likes putting graphs together. Um, but basically the pink is the, um, is the average growth since 1968 and it averages out at 8.6%. You, you, you can make a lot of money in agriculture if you're in the right place and you're doing it well and you're improving your asset. That's just, that's just the land appreciation. So I'll touch on a bit more of that shortly. Um, this is a very random survey done on a bus of Nuffield Scholars in Western Australia. I asked them for their land value in 1990, in 2000 and 2010, and then I charted all sorts of other stuff, but I pulled this one out. If you look along the line, the fourth one from the right is Spring Ridge, that's where I live. Our land value has changed by $2,000 an acre since 1990. Um, there's other places like Beaumont in Western Australia on the far right, on my right, yeah, you're right. Um, that, that land, even though it's only changed by $1,000, has gone up by 1,300%. Down near Esperance, very good farmers down there doing exceptional things. So, and then that's driving the value. There's really no external forces down there apart from agriculture. There's some different ones in our part of the world. Um, and the only other thing I learned from that is I'm not a, I've never been to Kalani in Western Australia, but I wouldn't suggest you go and buy land there because it's still cheap. Um, the business returns. Not only we do the whole business return, we separate by enterprise. So we have dry land farming on our farm, we have irrigation farming, and we have grazing. Uh, this, is, this is this current year's numbers, so that was up to June 2014. Uh, our dry land return last year was 4%, irrigation was 7 and grazing, as hard as we try, as the land values continue to go up, they're running about 8 DSE per hectare, we just cannot get that number to, to change. So we're going to have to think about what we do with 4,000 acres of grazing land. Uh, and, the, and the run on the right is the total business return. Equity range, uh, in our business the rules are 60% minimum, 80% maximum, and the blue line is our actual equity and where it's tracking at the moment. Um, in 2011 and also in 2013 we bought two farms, hence why we're dropping down, that's all that is, that's just pure new debt to expand our business. Uh, the projected equity as we go forward um, this was paying off a small amount of debt each year. We should be able to start putting that back in the right direction. But we're still in the, in the range we want to be. We don't want to be below 60, but we don't want to be above 80. Uh, the pillars, what works and what doesn't. Um, these are just some of our, our net per hectare, so what we call a gross margin per hectare. We've got sunflowers on the left to cotton on the right. Cotton has our, our highest average return per hectare. And we're only new cotton growers. Um, we're chasing that to probably chase the land value, if you want the truth. Uh, we've got to, as the land values goes up, we have to continually find a new pillar crop that's going to return greater than the previous one. The bread and butter crop here is LF Sorg, which is the second one on the left. Um, it's, it's what we grow the most of still, um, but I think cotton will have a place. Whether it replaces sorghum, who knows? That'll depend a bit on the chicken industry, I think. Um, but probably the significant thing about that with the dry land ones I just showed you, this is now dry land cost per hectare. If you look at dry land cotton on the right hand side, it is significantly more expensive to grow dry land cotton than it is to grow um, LF sorghum again. And to give you an example, an LF means long fallow. They're both the same fallow, both the cotton and the sorghum. 
I'll give you an example of the cotton cost. My Monsanto fee alone is equivalent nearly to what it costs me to grow one hectare of sorghum. And when I say the Monsanto fee, that's the licence fee we pay to Monsanto for the privilege to grow GM Bulgard cotton. But I wouldn't grow anything else. It's a great product. It's just expensive to pay them each year. Uh, and to pay for these things. Every farmer's got to have some sort of toy in their slides, so that's just a cotton picker. Uh, some irrigation, same deal. Irrigated cotton is, uh, is taking over. These prices were, like I've tried to use the average price over the last five years. Cotton price currently is 535 plus ginning. You'd probably get 585 a bale today. Um, but also for irrigated corn, you, you're in the high 300s. And sorghum's about spot on that price currently for this year. But once again, some irrigation net per hectare, cotton's the winner, but as I said before, with dryland cotton, same deal. It's significantly more expensive and greater risk to our business. Costs us about an extra $700,000 a year to grow cotton in our business than what it would be just to grow all sorghum. Uh, I want to have a bit of a whinge now. The, um, the rules are changing in agriculture and, and probably across the board in everything we do. Um, these are the things that I start thinking about every day. Uh, certainly food security. I'm, not, I'm sure our politicians don't understand farming. Probably Barnaby an exception. He really does have a good handle on agriculture. I won't have a go at him, but there's a lot of others that have no idea. They represent people on the coast and they've got no idea what agriculture is about uh, or what farming is about or what community is about in a rural area. Um, I don't think we pay enough for food. I was chatting to someone from Coles earlier today about this. Um, I just think it's the way we go around marketing what we eat is completely wrong. Um, our political system, I've, I've put the question there, but it is definitely too short-sighted. Um, and we definitely don't spend enough R&D. And I think agriculture, we have also dropped the ball because we're not on the front foot telling our story as well as we should. Um, in my region, in Liverpool Plains, we yield 40% above the national average. We've got great soils. We've got rainfall all year round. Our average wheat yield is 5.2 tonne to the hectare. and average sorghum yield is 7.5 tonne to the hectare. You'll, find, you'll go a long way around the world to find dry land yields like that. Um, we have 6% of the land area in Australia is arable. We're less than 1% where we live, um, but we've got a bucket load of minerals and resources underneath, and that's where the conflict begins. To give you one example, Shenhua, which is a Chinese, and the fact is Chinese doesn't really matter. It, it's, whichever, whoever, if this was an Australian company, BHP have got a mining lease also, also on Liverpool Plains. Um, if they paid $300 million for an exploration licence and when they kick off and they're about to start, well, they think they're going to start. Now they've been stopped at the moment. Um, we've got a stay of execution, I think, is the term. The cynics are saying it's because of a state election, but we'll wait and see. Um, the federal government has to sign off on this before they kick off. That's the, that's, it's the last hurdle before this mine kicks off. Um, they own 20,000 hectares of land. Um, they've, they've bought that and there's a bucket load of coal to come out of the ground. But probably the issue with it is, is that the way it was, the way it happened, the way it's got this far, and where we're at now, it's probably nearly, uh, I don't think, it's probably irreversible, I would imagine. Um, are we selling off the farm? I think we're diluting the financial benefits of a, a very good agricultural area. There's absolutely no way that anybody can guarantee damage to an aquifer or not damage to an aquifer. Um, our property rights, I think, are being violated. Uh, the rehab process after mining, we're watching it happen already in the Crindai district. It'll be OK, I guess, but we really don't know. Look, it just changes your whole environment. You've got nothing better to do, fly over the Hunter Valley one day. And the only reason they've come to us next is the Hunter Valley's nearly empty and we're next closest to Newcastle, and that's where the railway line goes. Um, but in saying that, am I against mining? Absolutely not, because it has a significant um, benefit to our economy, and there's no doubt. This stretched out to 2015, it's probably starting to drop down a little bit now. But agriculture is still flatlining and we've got to get a lot better at what we do there. Um, taking on the big boys, and this is basically trying to have a discussion with a mining company and a government that has approved a mining lease. It's been difficult, but we've really tried to protect what we've had. We've faced many obstacles um, and we continue looking for new ways to tell, to tell the story. And some of that has to be quite confrontational because the only way you get any action around here is to be confrontational. The future, all right, so wind, wind is over. Well, there might be one more. Um, we're in a new world. You know, everyone's dictated by health conscious or manipulated by the spin. You know, the first taxi I get in today, the one in front of me says that ban the live export trade. And I'm coming to a food conference. I'd call this a food conference in Canberra. That's the first thing I'll see on the back of a, of a taxi. That's just what's 
how the world is being run these days. But we have to be a lot more on the front foot and attack that full ball. Um, food safety, well, we've seen that issue more recently just now. Um, technology, technology is absolutely fantastic and I think it will lead the future as long as it works. If it doesn't work, all it does is become a frustration. And one thing I did notice when I was sitting there watching everyone else is that, like, I'm pretty tall, so normally not, no one can see how bald I am, but up there on that screen you can see the whole lot. And that's what happens when technology doesn't work. Um, <laughs> I think ownership and, and factory farming will become more prevalent, whether we like it or not. And I think that, that's something that we're going to have to look at differently and red type and compliance. And the bloody Kiwis, if they do win the Cricket World Cup, I'm going to have to move to Scotland. This is an interesting slide about the future. I, you look at where GDP was, and this is back to 1500, and you look at where the US, and we're, in my lifetime, in all our lifetimes, we've been dominated probably by a US economy and a European economy. I think China's going to end up back where it was, and most likely India will too. Um, and, and it's going to be very interesting to see how that changes our future. Um, you've all seen this chart before. We've got to produce as much food between now and 2050 as we have in all of history. Um, that's, that's the challenge that I face every day. And that's why we continually push our production system. I think the technology, I can see robots, sensors, I can see new communication. I think some, and there's, and there's talk, technology fits in these different categories. The technical aspect is that what we can measure is going to be mind-blowing in the future. And even some of the soil analysis that Sydney Uni is doing on our farm now is, I think, quite intriguing. Um, genetics, our experience with GM cotton has been outstanding. Uh, but I think there's going to be so many more benefits in the future in relation to into genetics. And that's not just in cropping, that could be livestock or anything else. Red tape, I just want to touch on red tape, another whinge. Everything is getting incredibly difficult to do. It's almost as if a government employee sits in an office and works out the hardest way for me to fill in a form to take up the most amount of time, usually for nothing. And that is really starting to get on my nerves. When I say it's 30% of my time, I probably spend three days a week in the office. I reckon one day a week is filling in some form for some government department. Um, I get frustrated by a lot of de the decision making takes too long. So don't take this personally, any government employees in here, you've all got your job to do, blah, blah, blah. But we need, to, we need more concise decision making. And I'll give you one example. We want to put a, uh, a new uh, channel to fill a, a storage on our farm. Now, for the guy to come out of state water and come and visit our farm, he has to pick up a GPS locator like this before he leaves the office. He has to carry that with him at all times. And this happened prior to that dreadful incident up at Cropper Creek where that guy got, got shot. This was prior to that. But for him to come out to my farm to look where I want to build this channel, he's got to get the GPS locator, he's got to go to the office when he leaves and say, I'm leaving, GPS locator on him at all times. When he stops at my kitchen table, so he's not moving, so they, and someone watches this, it's a guy in Sydney watching this thing drive along down the road all the way to Spring Ridge. It's a Spring Ridge, pulls up, we sit there and have a cup of tea. He's then got to ring up the bloke in Sydney and say, I'm just having a cup of tea because I'm just parked here because it's not moving anymore. So they, and then he has to then, when he leaves, he has to ring and say he's leaving and they track him all the way back, which is probably so he doesn't go to the pub. I don't know what the hell this thing's for. But that gives you an indication of how ridiculous our system has become. So therefore, he still hasn't been to our farm. I said, I'll come and get you on Sunday. He said, I can't do it. So we really do need to change some of these processes. Um, the loop, we always talk about the closed loop. I think food, our farms won't be called farms for much longer. I think they'll be factories of some description, and possibly they already are. I think we're going to get into precision production. There's precision ag. We're getting there with that. And there's a whole bunch of stories about what you do with yield maps. Uh, but I think precision production is really going to take off. I was at a chook farm last Friday. This bloke could type into his computer and he could tell me how heavy each bird in that shed, and there were 65,000 of them, they were going to be 787 grams by midnight that night. Now, I can give you an indication of what my sorghum yield is going to be sometime in May, but it's going to be somewhere between four and eight tonne per hectare. <laughs> so, so that gives you some indication of the, of the precision that, that what they're doing compared to what, in a broad acre scale, we're not up to yet. Um, information is becoming far easier to get. There's a Nuffield conference going on at the moment in France. Those guys are either on Twitter or Facebook most of the day giving out information that they're getting from Europeans, European leaders right now, and that's, that's dropping in while we're sitting here. Some of this stuff, that's just one example. There's numerous others, and people who are smarter than me will sort this out. But I think farmer research is, is something that, that we do, we've touched on, 
We've set up a group that does it. We put half a million bucks a year into our, into our own research. We actually share it with the community because we're such good guys. Um, I think that's going to that's going to really drive where research comes from. I think that's really the way of the world because it's, it's actually what we want. It's not what someone else thinks we want. We drive the agenda. But despite all that, I do enjoy what I do. And when you have dinner tonight, thank a farmer. Thank you.